Pete's house is all about together. My first experience meeting a woman who was being sexually exploited and trafficked was in the city of Chicago. I really had no concept that women were being forced to sell their bodies on the same streets and in the same neighborhoods where I was raising my family and driving my kids to school. I partnered with another ministry that does outreach to women who are caught in prostitution in the city. And I remember being significantly pregnant, waddling around the streets of Chicago, having conversations with women and just connecting with them because they too had had children. I saw buyers pull up their car alongside the street and have a conversation with a woman. And I would watch her get into the car and I think to myself, what experience is she gonna have that's violent and traumatic and dangerous to her? And when we had conversations with women who were being trafficked, that would be the most dignified conversation she would have for the day. Because soon after and soon before that conversation, she was treated as if she was a piece of property. Those experiences led to feeling as if God was saying, I can use you, I can use the church to give women a place to heal from their trauma and start a new life. We know that there are 24,000 women and girls who are sexually exploited in the Chicagoland area every year. And Naomi's House is the only residential program and would be the only day program in the DuPage and Kane County area Everything we do is geared toward how do we restore what was lost in the ugliness and the violence of trafficking. I grew up in a really loving family. The first trafficker I had, it was, it was subtle. He um, wooed me, um, romanced me, um, conned my family, made it seem like he was the good guy, made it seem like he was there to help me. None of my teachers like batted an eye or thought anything was amiss with me because I would still show up to school. And sometimes at school is where I, I had Johns meet me. It's, it's so alarming how many people just don't think it's real. It's happening at businesses that you walk by in neighborhoods. Wheaton, Aurora, Elgin, Elmhurst, Bolingbrook, Oakbrook, Yorktown Mall. These girls are your neighbor. They are in your neighborhoods. They are all around us. These are the girls that are trafficked. I came to Naomi's house when I was 25 years old. By that age, a lot of myself was killed because I had to take on a different identity. And I had to be a different person. And it was here at Naomi's house that I was encouraged to find my voice and use it for good. I was encouraged to be a leader. I just fell in love with her the moment I met her. She has so many gifts and she is so strong and she is so courageous and she's gonna do remarkable things. And all she needed was someone who believed that about her and a chance to do that. Healing takes time and it's different for every woman that we've served. And so I feel like God is just so eager to penetrate any hardness of their hearts to say that not only do I, I love you and I, I have healing for you, but I also have an abundant life for you that if you will just walk with me one day at a time, we will get there. The staff and the volunteers, they walk out the gospel every day. It really is through the love of the staff and the volunteers and all of those beautiful interactions that we have that they begin to get a glimpse of the love that God has for them. My life has forever been changed because of Naomi's house. We entered the year 2020 asking God, what is next for Naomi's house? He led us to the vision of opening what we're calling the Naomi's house gathering place. And this will be a day program. So from nine to five, we will offer the same services, the same tools that a woman needs in order to heal from her trauma, live in the present, and dream about her future. Our women need us to launch this program so that they can get the services they need 
to launch back into the community and live a healthy life outside of the trauma that they have experienced because of their sexual trauma. Well, I am so grateful for the, uh, the women and the staff at Naomi's house for sharing their stories with us. We are uh, so blessed to hear what God is doing there uh, and so grateful to be part of a church that is partnering with an organization like this in the Christmas season. I love what Kim said there that, uh, that the staff and the, the women there are really walking out the gospel every day and that's so true, church, that when we, uh, when we see these stories, we are seeing God at work uh, transforming our communities, transforming the lives of people around us. Uh, so before we go any further, I just wanted to pray and thank God for all he's doing and especially for the generosity uh, that you, Chapel Street Church, have been showing in this season. Let's pray. Father, we're so grateful for this opportunity to come and serve your name and your glory by serving Naomi's house. God, we pray in this season, Lord, that you would do some special work there. Father, that you would provide for all of the needs of these projects coming up. And God, that you would continue to rescue and redeem the women that are caught in trafficking in our community. Lord, may we be a part of your arm of justice at reaching out to those in need, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we are full swing into the Christmas season, and I don't know about you, but every Christmas I get quite nostalgic, and I think through uh, what's been going on this last year, and I, uh, I actually get really caught up in the Facebook memories. Uh, if you've ever seen those, they always kind of throw out a few images from days gone by on your Facebook, uh, and one that popped up recently for me is this one. Uh, this is a picture of me right when I arrived in America for the first time next to uh, my first ever American car, GMC Envoy. Now, there's a lot of things in this uh, picture to laugh at, including my hair, but uh, my, the face I'm pulling, I want to explain that to you. The reason I'm pulling this face is because uh, this was an amazing car to me. You see, in England, the cars that we drive tend to be a little bit more embarrassing. They don't quite have the same power and, uh, and excess. And so I was totally blown away by this car. And in fact, the first week I had this car, uh, I remember being in a Walmart uh, and putting the pedal down and it was just too much for me. I spun out. I was actually really lucky that nothing terrible happened uh, because I was so used to these, these cars in England that basically have engines from recycled kids' toys. Uh, but uh, I, I remember this time in my life as being this season when I was so excited about what was ahead of me. I'd left my home and uh, I'd come to America and my dad had been very generous, helped me get this car, helped me get set up. And I remember just thinking that there was nothing in the way of me finally going after everything that I'd ever wanted. I could become the person I'd always wanted. I was ready for success. I was ready for uh, all kinds of new experiences. And I think we've all been through a moment like that in our lives where we've imagined this life in which we would be free from the things that we think hold us back from our happiness or our success. But what's significant for us as believers is that the call of Jesus is actually to leave behind our empty notions of what happiness and success actually are and to return home to the open arms of a God who is all that we need. If you have been uh, going with us over the last couple of weeks, you know that we're in this series for Christmas called Home for Christmas. And we've been tracing this idea of home throughout the whole story of Scripture. A couple of weeks ago, Pastor Jeff led us through the story of Genesis, where we head of uh, being far from home, where Adam and Eve forsook everything that God had provided for them in their home. They lost that when they chose their own idea of what was good and what they wanted over what God had provided them in himself. And then just last week, we had Pastor Stelling talk to us about longing for home. This moment that we find ourselves in now where we are longing for God to put right what has gone wrong, but we're not quite there. And how do we live in the midst of this season where we're waiting God, for God to fulfill his promises? This week, we want to look at the idea of returning home, which I think is really the very heart of what Christianity is really all about. The story that we're going to look at this week is all about homecoming. What does it look like to return home? We're going to do it through uh, the story of the prodigal son, one of Jesus' most well-known parables and one of his most beloved as well, certainly one of my most famous, favorite uh, stories in all of Scripture. Uh, and it's famous because this story really hits at something really, really important. This is what Pastor Tim Keller says about this story. He says, If we read the narrative in light of the Bible's sweeping theme of exile and homecoming, we will understand that Jesus has given us more than a moving account of individual redemption. He has retold the story 
of the whole human race and promise nothing less than hope for the world. That's a bold claim. It's the story of the whole human race. I think it is. If you're unfamiliar with this story or you've forgotten, it revolves around the account of two sons and a father. Specifically, the story of the younger son who abandons his family in pursuit of everything he's ever wanted and the pain that comes from that. And I want to consider this story through the actions of the three central characters in the moment that this son returns home. And I want to ask this question this morning. What does it look like this Christmas for you and I to return home to the Father? What does it look like this Christmas to return home to the Father? So let's dive in and take a look first with the most famous character in the story, of course, the younger brother, the prodigal son. Uh, I've uh, been finding myself becoming a little in need of encouragement, more so than uh, days before this year. I'm sure a lot of you can, uh, can empathize with me. 2020 has been a, a discouraging year in a lot of ways. But you can always rely on the internet to provide you with some good means of picking yourself back up. Uh, and one website that I love to go to is kind of an account of all these stories of why my kid is crying. Why my kid is crying. And what happens on this website is that different parents will post pictures of their kids and all of the ridiculous things that are causing them to cry. For example, to help you understand this, here's a picture right here. This is a, a, a little guy that is crying because the parents wouldn't let him kiss the toilet. Wouldn't let him kiss the toilet. That's very unfortunate. I'm sorry that your parents wouldn't let you do that. Uh, here's another one right here. I think in a moment... Our next one. Here we go. She's not allowed to eat batteries. This is terrible. Why wouldn't you let this baby eat batteries? Terrible. That's why this uh, little girl is crying. And then one more. This is my own kid that is crying because we wouldn't let him eat cookies all day. This is little Jonathan when he was younger. And he was very sad that we wanted to cut the cookies off. But uh, it's really funny. We look at these pictures and as parents, we, we look at these scenarios where our kids are, are longing for something uh, that they think are going to make them happy. And we know that it won't, but they long for it anyway. And I think that we think we grew out of this behavior. That we grew out of this behavior of longing for the things that are not good for us. But the truth is, none of us really grew out of this. It's actually something I think we all struggle with a lot, all of our lives. We have this tendency in us to chase after things that we think will make us happy. We long for them in our soul and we race after them in our lives. But God has something better for us. The story of the prodigal son, the story of the lost son, is the story of God revealing something better. This is how the story of the younger brother starts. It says, He said there was a young man who had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had and took a journey into a far country. And there he squandered his property in reckless living. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who had sent him into his fields to feed pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger. I will arise and go to my father and I will say to him, father, I have sinned against heaven and before you, I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. We could summarize this first act of the story, this first moment in a lot of different ways, but the way I want to summarize it this morning is this, is that it is the story of the broken heart of the younger brother, the broken heart of the younger brother. See, at the outset of this parable, we are introduced to a young son who has asked his father something pretty incredible. He has asked him for his inheritance. Now, this might seem a little rude to us, but it's actually far more than just something that's impolite. You see, what the son is really asking here for, when he asks for his inheritance is he's asking the father to divide up his estate and give him everything that was coming to him on the event of his father's death. So essentially what he's, he's saying to his father is, I wish you were dead. I wish you were dead because I really want what you can provide to me now. I don't want to wait until you die one day. I would like that to be now. That would have been, must have been incredibly painful for this father to hear. A son essentially saying, I love what you can give me more than I love you. 
But what's more astounding is that this father actually does this. And this would have been incredibly difficult for the father because all of his wealth was tied up in land. Usually in these days, the oldest son would get about two thirds. If there was two sons, he would get two thirds of the inheritance, while the younger brother would get a third. There would be a double portion for the eldest firstborn. And so what this father would have to do is, in order to get the inheritance for the younger brother, would have to sell off a third of his property in order to build that equity and give it to him. This father would have had to tear his own life apart in order to give this son what he wants, but he does it. It's astounding. And then this son travels off to a distant land and he indulges himself in everything that he could imagine would bring him happiness, everything he could ever want. And it doesn't take long before he has spent everything he has and finds himself in ruin. He's stuck literally eating with pigs in a slop and in service to someone else because he can't even take care of himself anymore. That's where this pursuit of pleasure has led him. Let me ask you, what is this younger brother's problem? Why did he make choices like this? Why would he do this with his life? Why would he abandon his family? Why would he forsake his father in pursuit of all this? It's because he had a broken heart. He had a broken heart that longed for things that couldn't satisfy him, that longed for the wrong things. Jeremiah the prophet in the Old Testament puts it this way. He says that the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? See, the Bible is very clear throughout its story that the fundamental problem of the human race is that our hearts long for the wrong things. Isaiah puts it this way as well. He has a really great picture for this. He says, why do you spend your money for that which is not bread and your labor for that which does not satisfy? Listen diligently to me and eat what is good and delight yourselves in rich food. See, our problem as human beings is that our hearts love the wrong things. We look to satisfy ourselves with things that ultimately leave us empty and often in ruin. And what's worse is that just like that younger son, we usually forsake our father to get what we want. In fact, we don't usually, we do it every time. We forsake our heavenly father who loves us and cares for us to go after what we think will make us happy, what will make us successful. This is a great way to understand what sin is. Are you more in love with what God does for you than you are with God himself? Are you more interested in what God can provide for you than in God himself? See, in one sense, the story of the Bible is that we're all the younger brother. We are all the son that has forsaken our father in pursuit of everything that we think we want. We all in various ways have demanded our father cut us loose so that we can chase the desires of our hearts. Our broken hearts, our sick, wayward hearts deceive us. And we just think if we just had a little bit more money, if I just had a better relationship, I just had a more respected career, more opportunities to relax and be myself. We chase and we chase and we chase and we chase and we find ourselves empty. But the truth is, you and I will never ever find our happiness and success in something other than God. We're not made for that. This is how our good friend C.S. Lewis puts it. He says, if I find in myself desires which nothing in this world can satisfy, the only logical explanation is that I was made for another world. The reason that this son cannot satisfy the longings of his heart by indulging himself in his wants is because he was never made to be satisfied by those things. But the younger brother isn't the only one in this family with a broken heart. There's someone else in this family that's suffering from the same problem. It's his older brother. His older brother. Another thing that I like to do at Christmas time with my family is we like to play board games. It's a big tradition. Get really excited about it. But one game that has become kind of banned in uh, my house and really any of my family's houses is uh, this game right here. Monopoly. The game that destroys families. It is a terrible, terrible game. I, for a long time, loved this game. I got so into it, which is why it was eventually banned in my house. Um, It is uh, this game that just 
It brings out the Westerners, doesn't it? But why does it do it? Why does it get so heated in a game of Monopoly? It's because the whole point of the game is to be more successful than everyone else. It's to beat everyone else, to have the better record, the better deals. It's about making good deals and being wise with your money and also being ruthless and merciless towards everybody else in the game. Doesn't matter what the relationship is, whether you're playing with your dad, with your mom, with your sister, your brother, or your spouse, they're all going down. It's all about the win. Now, I think that the older brother has a little bit of a monopoly problem. And I'll explain what I mean by that in a minute. But I want to jump ahead in this story to look at this character, to look at this older brother, uh, for reasons that I hope will become clear later. But I want to take a look at what his problem is. This is what Jesus tells us when he tells us about the older brother towards the end of this parable. He says, Now the older son was in the field, and as he came and drew near to the house, he had music and dancing, and he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, Your brother has come, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has received him back safe and sound. But he was angry and refused to go in. His father came out and entreated him, but he answered his father, Look, these many years I've served you, And I never disobeyed your command, yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came, who's devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf for him. And he said to him, son, you were always with me, and all that is mine is yours. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad, for this brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. You know, when we read this parable, and it's a very well-known parable, it's really easy for us to pick on the younger brother because his sins and his mistakes are so very clear to us in this story. But one of the most important details of this story, one of the most crucial things that that I think Jesus wants us to understand is that this older brother's heart was just as broken as the younger's. He was just as in love with the wrong things as his younger brother was. That might have looked different in the way that he lived his life, but essentially, it's the same problem. Just like a bad game of Monopoly, he has become fixated on his own success and his own record, and he's become ruthless and merciless towards his brother. Let me explain this a little bit more and why I'm saying this about this older brother, because you might not notice it on first glance. See, the first thing that we notice about this older brother is that when his younger brother returns home, he refuses to go into the father's feast. The father is throwing this party, celebrating that the son is home, but he doesn't go in. He's angry that his brother has been received. And so the father has to leave the party to come out to him. Now, we might not realize this, but in, this, in these days, this was a huge insult to the father. For this older brother, the firstborn, to refuse to go into his father's feast and force the father to come out to him, every one of the guests at this party would have noticed it. It would have been a huge dishonor to the father. And when the father actually does come out, he tries to comfort the son. He tries to talk with him. And the older brother kind of doubles down. He says, look, essentially says, listen, you, I see what you're doing. He doesn't even honor his father by calling him father. He just says, look. And he chastises him. He says, I never did what this guy did. I never did what my brother did. And where's my reward? Where's my due? And then he says something so telling. He says, this son of yours. Did you catch that? He doesn't even think of him as his brother anymore. This son of yours. And he lists off everything that his younger brother is doing, all these terrible things, which are all true. Everything's true. But this oldest son is basically leveling two criticisms against his father. The first is, you owe me because I did everything right, father. And the second thing is, I am so much better than my brother. And this is where the older brother's broken heart is really exposed. This is where we see what's really wrong with the older brother. Because there's two things wrong with this older brother's relationships with his father and his brother. The first is with his father is that he has a transactional relationship with his father. A transactional relationship. What I mean by this is that he thinks it's all about giving to get. This is what he says to the father. He says, look, these many years I've served you. I never disobeyed your command, yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. I served you and you never gave me. 
I put in the work. I deserve payment for that. You owe me, Dad. See, all the older brother is really revealing to us is that just like his younger brother, he loves the wrong things. He cares more about what he gets from his father than he does about his father himself. The younger brother may have been in love with himself and chasing down all the pleasures that his heart could ever want. The older brother is in love with being good. He's in love with being moral. He's in love with being right. But he still doesn't love his father. His father is just a means to an end. He served his father not because he loved him, but because he wanted power over him. He wanted control over him. He wanted to be owed. Second problem he has is that he has a comparative relationship with his brother. He says, when this son of yours came, when this son of yours came who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf for him. Look at my brother compared to me. I've always served you. I've always obeyed you. I always did what was right. And look at him. Look at what he did to you, what he did to this family, what he did with his inheritance. Look at him compared to me. And what's the end goal with saying this? Again, it's the same. You owe me. You owe me because I've served you and you owe me because I'm better than him. It's the same story. This older brother's heart is so broken. He doesn't long for his brother to be restored. He doesn't want to see him blessed and redeemed and restored. He just wants to see him fail and he wants to focus on his own success. Here's the challenge that this puts to us. This story of the older brother. This broken heart of the older brother. It forces us to ask about our own life. Where are we living transactionally with God? And where are we living comparatively with other people? Where are we playing the same game that the older brother is playing? Where are we more in love with being right and moral than we are with loving God and our neighbor with our whole lives? It's just as toxic to our lives to be in love with our own moral purity as it is to change, chase our desires and self-indulge. Just as toxic. And friends, you know who is most in danger of becoming like the elder brother? It's me. It's us. Believers. Religious people who are fixated on trying to obey God, trying to be right, trying to do the right things. It starts with such an innocent desire to want to do good, but when we become fixated on that, when our hearts fall in love with being right, it twists us and it warps us and it breaks us. And if we allow ourselves to become older brothers, we will cause just as much damage as the younger brother, if not more. We will become bitter to God towards all the perceived injustices in our life, the way that he hasn't treated us the way that we think he deserves. He didn't give us the promotion that we thought we deserved. He didn't give us the set of circumstances this year in 2020 that we thought we deserved. We'll become bitter towards others for not being as good as we think we are. Well, if only they could live a little bit more like me. If only they could pray like me. If only they could treat their spouse like I treat my spouse, raise their kids like I raise my kids, to spend their money the way that I spend my money. You know, it's not that alien to us, these behaviors. We see it all the time. In our culture right now, we struggle with dividing everybody up into camps of who's better, who's more right, who's done what they should have, who has the best ideas and who has the worst, who's causing the most problems. Is it liberals or conservatives? Is it Christians or atheists? Is it the wealthy and the powerful? Is it those in the welfare state? Is it millennials? Is it boomers? Who's the camp that you look to in your mind as being someone you can compare yourself to and say, well, at least I'm not them? Because do you know what they do? Do you know how they make their decisions and the things that they think are important and valuable? I don't do that. What we all need, you and I, is to put away our efforts to self-justify and to self-satisfy, 
to give up our own efforts to get control over God's blessings. We need to come to a Father who loves us, not because we've done right, but because he's full of grace. So let's talk about the Father. Let's talk about the Father. This is this middle section of the story that we've skipped over, but is without a doubt my favorite part. It's down in verse 20 of Luke 15, and he arose, the youngest son, after he's realized the error of his ways, he arose and he came to his father, but while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and ran to him. His father saw him and felt compassion, ran and embraced him and kissed him, and the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, bring quickly the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring the fattened calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate for this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found and they began to celebrate. See, Jesus is telling this parable to the crowd because he wants them to know what their heavenly father is like. He wants elder brothers and younger brothers alike to come and know that they have a hope in their heavenly father. See, as the youngest son arrives home, he's come prepared with an apology. He's ready to make things right. He's got a whole speech lined up. But while he was a long way off, the father runs. The father sees him and runs towards him. He throws himself on him. For a Middle Eastern patriarch in this time would have been humiliating. You have to imagine him standing at this estate, hiking up his robes, running with his legs out in front of all of the servants and all the hired hands and throwing himself at his son. This son that the hired hands and the servants know what he did. They watch this son tear the family apart, reject his father, and now they see the father throwing himself at him. He kisses him. A reminder, he has no apologies even been given yet. The son hasn't even been able to get his speech out because while he was a long way off, the father ran to him. And as the younger son attempts to get his apology out, the father says, put my best robe on him. Put a ring on his finger. Put shoes on his feet. Let's throw a feast. Let's have a party. Do you know why he's saying this? It's because he doesn't want him to come back as a hired hand. The father does not want his son to try and pay off his debt, work off his debt, earn his way back. He wants to put a ring on his finger and call him his son right then and there. The best robe would have been the father's robe. He's essentially covering him. And remember, this son has been with pigs out in the field. He probably stinks. He's probably a mess. And the father said, put my best robe on him. Cover his shame with my wealth. The father loves this son. And for the people hearing this parable from Jesus, they would have been flawed that a father would love a son that did what this son did the way that this father does. No one in that crowd would have ever imagined that God the Father could be like this. And I'm willing to bet this morning that there's probably a lot of us that can't imagine a father like this either. But he is like this. The truth is that Jesus is trying to get us to understand is this is our heavenly father. But what about older brothers? What does the father say to him when the older brother rejects him and insults him and becomes frustrated with him? Does he react with anger? No. Still grace. Still mercy. He says, Son, you are always with me and all that is mine is yours. The same tender mercy that he showed the broken-hearted younger brother, he shows to the broken-hearted older brother. He's saying, come home, son. Join this feast. I want you to be a part of this. You notice that the older brother says, this son of yours, but the father says, this brother of yours. He's trying to reunite them. The father wants his brother to see his brother as a brother again. This is what a homecoming looks like in the kingdom of heaven. This is what returning home to God looks like. It looks like open arms. That while we are still a long way off, run to us and embrace us. His call to us is to come home. Whether we are an older brother or a younger brother, to come home. How do we do it? 
by letting the love of the Father melt away our fear. Because the truth is, most of us don't want to go home because we are afraid that the Father who is waiting for us is waiting to shame us, to guilt us, to punish us. Because we know our mistakes. We know what we've done wrong. We know how we've rejected him, how we've chased other things, how our heart has loved the wrong things. And so we're afraid. Jesus told this story for the express reason of killing that fear. So that we could all see that the Father is not waiting to punish us. He's waiting to embrace us. Jesus' good friend John wrote this in his first letter in the New Testament. He wrote, In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation or atonement in other translations for our sins. It's one of my favorite verses in the Bible. You know what's telling us about Jesus? He's the true older brother. You know, the real older brother in this situation should have went out to seek for the younger brother, to bring him home, to love him, to spend whatever was necessary to bring him back. This is a bad older brother. But friends, Jesus is a good older brother. He's the perfect older brother who comes knowing the Father's true worth, who loves the Father perfectly and comes after us, chases us to bring us home. You know, this year has been full of a lot of different things for me, as I'm sure it has been for you. And I think if I'm honest, as I've read this and prepared for this, God's kind of shown me some areas where I have been both a younger brother and an older brother. I've tried to encourage myself and chase after the things this year that I think are gonna make me happy, that are gonna satisfy me. And at the same time, I've become frustrated and bitter with God for all the ways that this year hasn't gone the way I wanted it to. And maybe I've compared myself to a few other people as well. But God's asking me to come home. To come home. You know, this story gets called the prodigal son because prodigal means that uh, lavish or spending in excess, just as the younger brother did, as this prodigal son did. But Tim Keller suggests that this story actually should be called something else because there's someone else who spends more is more lavish than that son. Do you know who it is? It's the father. The father, the prodigal God. You know, what I love about the Christmas season is that this is a time when we remember that God did not leave us in a far off country, but he ran out to us through the person of his son, Jesus. When we celebrate and we sing about that child in the manger, We are singing and celebrating about the moment in which God ran out to us. There are few moments more suitable for returning home to God than Christmas. And so I challenge you to think about what it means to come home for Christmas as believers. I think it means just a couple of things. To acknowledge the places in our life where we have wandered from God to acknowledge the places in our life where we have tried to earn or control God. And lastly, to put ourselves into the care of a father whose arms are open wide and who is everything that we could ever need or want. Friends, my hope for you as we listen to this story this morning is that if there is any place in your heart where you are afraid to come home, any place where you doubt God's love for you, because of what you have done wrong or because of what you've done right. That you would see that Jesus' words to you are that there is a Father whose arms are open wide. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this amazing parable. Every time I read it, Lord, I am reminded of how great your love is for people like me who have been wayward, who have chased so many different empty things instead of you. And for me, in those moments when I have believed you owed me something, when I thought that by doing good, by obeying you, I was somehow earning and deserving blessings from you. God, I pray you would forgive me for those times, for those ways in which I've done that, Lord, and that you would bring me home into your arms. 
And Lord, we love you and we are so grateful for your pursuit of us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I want to thank you for joining us this morning. I want to leave you uh, with this prayer of benediction. May you go in the name of the Lord who seeks you out through the person of his son and who brings you home that he might embrace you and redeem you. It's in his name that we go. Amen. We'll catch you next week.